key feature of inheritance in Java is that Java allows us to override methods. When a class overrides a method, it basically means that it redefines that method. So for example, in this class hierarchy, Jack has a method called foo, which takes no arguments and returns void. Well, if in Lisa we also define a method named foo that takes no arguments and returns void, then Lisa overrides foo. Now, it's perfectly legal in this overridden foo to do something entirely different from whatever is done in the version in Jack, but generally the idea with overriding methods is that the override should do basically the same thing, but something more appropriate, more specific to this subtype. So for example, if a mammal has an eat method, then a hamster might also have an eat method because hamsters eat in their own particular way. In any case, the important question is how do you know which version of this method is being called? Is it the one in Jack being invoked or is it the one in Lisa? Well, say we have a TED reference, T, and then at some point we assign T an actual object, and then we're going to invoke T.foo. So the question is which version of foo are we invoking? Well, this depends upon the runtime type of T. What's the actual object being held in T at the time of this invocation? If T holds a TED object, then this is going to invoke the foo defined in Jack. But if T holds a Lisa, Kate, or Mike object, then it's going to invoke the foo defined in Lisa. If we have a Kate reference K, and then at some point we assign some object to K, and then invoke k.foo, well the rule is still that it matters what kind of actual object at runtime is being held in Kate, but because a Kate reference is always going to hold either a Kate or a Mike object, in this case we know that it's always going to invoke the foo defined in Lisa, because Kate and Mike both inherit the foo defined in Lisa. So be clear about the role of the compiler and the runtime in this scenario. The compiler looks at the compile time type of the object and then the name of the method and the arguments provided to it and determines whether it's a valid method call. But if a method is overridden, it's left till runtime to decide which actual version is being invoked, and that depends on the type of the actual object. Recall that at the beginning I said Java is mostly a static language, but with some elements of dynamicism. Well, this is what I was talking about. This is an example of runtime polymorphism. When we invoke a method, the actual method being invoked can depend upon the actual type of the object, and the actual type isn't determined until runtime. In fact, that Java allows us to assign different types to a reference is itself an element of dynamicism. The fact that our TED reference T might hold something other than exactly a TED object, that violates strict static typing. So Java isn't entirely static. Another scenario in which we want to get around the strictures of strict static typing is something like this. Say we have two unrelated classes, Nick and Diane. They're unrelated in the sense that Nick doesn't inherit from Diane and Diane doesn't inherit from Nick, though of course they do have the common ancestor object. And say both of these classes have a method of the same name with the same arguments and the same return type. And what we want to be able to do is hold these two unrelated objects in a common reference so we can invoke this method they both share in such a way that which method is invoked depends upon the type of the object at runtime. So for example, we'll have a reference x to which we might assign a Nick or a Diane object, and then when we invoke x.foo, which foo gets invoked at runtime should depend upon whether x is holding a Nick object or a Diane object. The problem is that x needs to be of a type that can hold both a Nick or a Diane object. So you might say we should make x of type capital O object. This would allow us to assign either a Nick or a Diane to x. The problem is that we can't invoke foo on x. x's compile time type is object. The object class doesn't have any such method foo, so the compiler doesn't allow this. Even if we write our code in such a way that x is only going to possibly be holding a Nick or a Diane object and both of those have a foo method, well, the compiler doesn't even try to figure that out, so it doesn't presume to know whether that's true or not. So as far as it's concerned, foo is not a valid method to invoke via the reference x. The solution to this problem is to create what Java calls an interface. An interface is simply a list of methods, but those methods don't have any actual code in them. So here we have an interface named Philip with just one method defined in it, foo, 
but rather than defining an actual body for this method, we just put a semicolon instead of a pair of curly braces. Once we create an interface, we can declare that a class implements an interface. When a class implements an interface, it is required to have a definition for each one of the methods listed in the interface. So Nick and Diane must both implement a method foo that takes no parameters and returns void. If they didn't, the compiler would complain that they don't properly implement Philip. You can think of an interface as like a contract that imposes upon any class that implements it a requirement to have that set of methods. The gain from this is that an interface acts like a type definition. We can't instantiate any Philip objects, but actually Diane and Nick, because they both implement Philip, then their objects are considered to be valid kinds of Philip objects. So what we can do now is create a reference of type Philip, and then we can assign any object of a class which implements Philip to this reference, and then invoke the methods defined in Philip via that reference. Now when we write x.foo, this is legal because x is of type philip, and philip is declared to have such a method foo. Which version gets invoked here, of course, depends upon the type of the actual object held in x at the time of the call. Understand, though, that because the compiler sees x as of type philip, then the only thing we can get at via this reference are the methods listed in the interface philip. If Nick and Dan happen to have some other methods in common, but those methods aren't listed in Philip, then we can't use x to get at them. And as for fields, well, an interface never includes fields, so you never get at fields via a reference to, of an interface type. Finally, when a class implements an interface, all of the descendants of that class are considered to also implement the interface. So here, if Nick has a subclass Ian, well then Ian is considered a valid kind of Philip object.